Carbohydrate metabolism mostly, right? Or pretty much exclusively, right? We've talked about the you know, degradation of like complete oxidation of glucose and then some sort of side pathways with glycogen synthesis and degradation, pentose phosphate pathway. Now we're going to connect into the, you know, one of our other sort of nutritional compounds is, and that's fats, right? What about fats? We get energy from fat. And there's a lot of energy from fats. Now I'm gonna show you, to try to illustrate how much energy of fat, I'm gonna show you, I did this early this morning, got my wife to take a little video of me. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm spraying some olive oil, right? Uh, triglyceride olive oil has a lot of oleic acid like this. And then I'm gonna ignite it with just hold it up to a match. And then, uh, See what happens. See, there's a lot of energy in that olive oil, right? We're oxidizing that. that. Like, do you want to see it again? <laughs> Here we go. See, like that blowtorch, right? There's a lot of energy in that, that olive oil, right? So, uh, of course, it, with people, we try to uh, harness that energy, use enzymes and tightly control that whole oxidation process, you'd be able to convert that energy into useful physiological work. Um, oh, I don't know like this. Like, so, so, you know, if you think about, ro this is rocket fuel, this is a common rocket fuel, RP1 rocket fuel, just straight chain hydrocarbon here. It's not that much different, you know, chemically than a triglyceride. There's a ton of carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-hydrogen bonds that can completely oxidize the CO2 in water, and if you do that, you release a lot of energy. So what fat metabolism is basically about harnessing that energy, and we're gonna see how it then integrates with the metabolism, the, the carbohydrate metabolism that we've already talked about. You know, this is particularly important in things. So I wasn't the only one who was huffing and puffing in the mountains this weekend. Anybody uh, from Auburn familiar with the Western States Endurance Run? So this is one of the most this, over the world, this is one of the most iconic ultra marathons that, that there is. It starts at what they used to call it, Squaw Valley, whatever they're calling it these days, and runs to Auburn 100.2 miles, 100.2 miles. And uh, so that took place this last week. It started Saturday morning. And um, the person who won it, uh, it's, his name is Jim Walmsley. Uh, there he is right now. This, was, this wasn't this year, this was several years back when they actually set the course record of 14 hours and 9 minutes and 28 seconds. If you do the math, that math is, uh, it's about an eight and a half minute mile for 100.2 miles. I don't know if any of you have run runs, but eight and a half. When I was running marathons, I could run an eight, uh, marathon an eight minute mile path, but that was like in a flat course on pavement, right? And he's going up and down in, how, how hot was it? It was like 100 degrees down in the valleys. It goes down in, uh, in those canyons uh, outside of Auburn. So it ended up being, I think he came in this year, like he won it this year too, and so he won it, he, I think it was 14, 16. So he was off the, the record pace, but uh, still basically an eight and a half minute mile pace. Amazing. So that's not, that's not all carbohydrate metabolism. You're not gonna get all your energy from your carbs running 14 hours like that. That's fat metabolism. A good chunk of your energy is just uh, fat metabolism uh, there. Wamsley's probably no more better known for what's known as the Wamsley's wrong turn. Because the first time he ran this race, he started out, it's a 100 mile race, he got to 92 miles, he was way in the lead. He was like hour, one hour ahead of everybody else. He was on course record pace and he made a wrong turn at mile 92. And he got kind of lost. He was kind of out of it, you know. These, it's pretty like this. And they found him wandering around Highway 49. <laughs> and they said, Jim, Jim, come on. And you know, you can't exactly, you, there's a limit to how much like this. They basically convinced him he had to go backwards. And he ended up walking in and finishing, but, uh, but it was like, here's this guy who was just like blowing the course record and it's like, what's that? And he made a wrong turn eight miles from the end. Anyway, he recovered from that. Uh, I put this link in here, which you can have it. And actually, I think what I'll do is when I get done, if we get done like at uh, 12.30, I'll go ahead and there's like a 15 minute YouTube video that talks about his story. It's pretty, a, a pretty poignant story. And it's a local kind of thing. Like, and it's just one of these, in the ultra, ultra marathon world, uh, this is a, a very iconic race. And it's, uh, it's kind of fun to, to go up there and watch people 
I tried to get it in. There's a, there's a really, um, they, uh, the, the time cut off is 30 hours. And so um, the, the hour before, the, between the 29th and the 30th hour, then it's a big deal because there's a whole bunch of people out there who are just trying to finish, right, and try to get in under the 30 hour mark. And if you go to, it's, I think it's what the, the um, Auburn High School track is basically where the, the, the finish is. Anyway, it's kind of kind of cool. But Walmsley has nothing on the Bartail Godwit, okay? <laughs> the Bartail Godwit that feeds up in the mud flats off the coast of uh, coast of Alaska does a migration like an eight to eleven day migration all the way across here of about what thirty uh, I think thirty eight hundred miles or something like that. Maybe it's six. Now I can't remember that. I know I think it was close to like 6,800 miles in there, non-stop, non-stop for, you know, eight, eight days traveling like that. That's fat metabolism, right? You're not, your carbs aren't like that. You need the most energy, the, the best caloric density that you can, and that's going to be fat metabolism. All right. So I'm going to start with a few slides here, and then once we get into the real pathway stuff, I'll, I'll, I'll shut this off and then go. So the, the first step, if we're going to try to oxidize our triglycerides, our, a lot of our triglycerides are actually stored within adipose tissue, right? Within fat, fat tissue, when you have a fat, a fat cell, triglyceride. And there are a series of different lipases. Remember our triglyceride is glycerol backbone, three fatty acids. So there's a series of lipases that release free fatty acids from there. One of them, this one's called HSL, it's hormone sensitive lipase and it's uh, things like glucagon and epinephrine stimulate that to allow for the, the hydrolysis of the uh, hydrolysis of the triglyceride and then you make free fatty acids. Now free fatty acids are more soluble than triacylglycerols but they're still not that soluble and so in order to be able to carry it around to whatever cell that actually might need to, to metabolize it to get energy it has to be carried get some Carried. And it's done when it goes in, enters into the bloodstream. It binds to a protein. I think I've talked about this before a few times. Called uh, serum albumin. And serum albumin is a protein that just binds fatty acids and helps carries them around through the blood uh, bloodstream. It also binds other lipophilic molecules like retinoic acid and retinal and all that stuff. But it basically is a carrier of um, uh, is a carrier of of the uh, fatty acids, a, a lipophilic molecule through the bloodstream. Then once those, those fatty acids get to a target tissue, whether it's your heart or muscle or, or whatever it is that actually needs to, to burn it, but not the brain. The brain doesn't do this. The brain, to, to, like the brain relies strictly on the carbohydrates and the glucose. Well, not strictly. We'll get to that, that point in a little bit. Um, but then, actually, we'll go back here. Then what has to happen, it, it enters in the cell, and I think that's where I'll pick up and talking about the pathway of like, okay, we're gonna get it at the cell, get it into the cell, and then the actual oxidation takes place in the mitochondria, and we have to basically transport it into the mitochondria, and then that's where the actual oxidation takes place. While you're doing that, What's that? The minimum distance for their flight path is about 10,000 kilometers. How many miles is that? I can't remember. That's probably like 6,400 miles or something. Like what is? I can't remember what that conversion factor is. 6,213. 6,213 miles in like eight days or something like that, all the time, right? Uh, the, the, Draw us out. Did you come? Did you figure out what? Uh, um, what was I asking? How many? Uh, oh, it's eight days. Is, is that? I think that's where we're at. Eight days. I, think I saw an article. The record. The record one where they actually like, tracked it with a satellite or something was from Alaska to Tasmania. That one took eleven days. 
All right, here's our cell. We have our fatty acids. And we're gonna start with, um, we'll take this palmitic acid to make it easy. So here's our fatty acid. One, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So there's our, our palmitic, our fatty acid that's come into the cell. It's been delivered there from uh, serum albumin. And ultimately, we have to get that into the mitochondria. Where the actual oxidation is going to take place. The first step is to activate it to a coenzyme A thioester. We've seen coenzyme A thioesters. Remember, it's acetyl CoA. We had acetyl CoA. Right? And so what th their enzyme that does this takes free coenzyme A, <laughs> HS CoA. Remember, co and coenzyme A was a scraping molecule, but it has a thiol at the very end. And that's kind of what we highlight here. And we're going to make. And actually, I'm just going to to keep this a little bit simple. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead. I'll put the S CoA here, and I'm gonna put R. You got, can you can handle that R there, right? That's all. That all is is all those carbons at the end. This creates a a thioester. That thioester is a pretty high energy bond. We talked about that in the citric acid cycle. We say one of the things that drove the citrate synthase reaction. Uh, in you know, forming of the carbon-carbon bond in the citric acid cycle was the free energy of hydrolysis of the coenzyme A thioester of acetyl-CoA. So this, we're gonna have to get some energy to be able to make that bond. So we're gonna get that energy from ADP, but actually, uh, we're not gonna make ADP plus PI, we're gonna make AMP plus PPI. So, Normally, you know, when we cleave ATP, we do it between the beta and gamma phosphate. In this case, we're actually cleaving, we're cleaving between the alpha and the beta uh, phosphate here. Professor, did we lose an oxygen when we added the COA? Yes, okay. yes. probably went to water. I had to go through the mechanism, probably went to water. Yeah. Okay, now what's the significance of that? The significance is like the UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. This is going to, we're gonna bring in water and we're gonna make two phosphates uh, out of that. We're basically, the, so the thermodynamics of this is driven both by the hydrolysis of the pyrophosphate as well as this. And for the name of this enzyme is acyl, CoA Okay, so, so now we have this high energy thioester, you know, fatty acyl thioester here. What I said is our actually oxidative reactions are gonna occur in the mitochondria. So we have to get it in there. Now, what would be nice is, would straightforward is if, if there was just some sort of transporter that allowed it to go in, it's never that simple. There's actually a different molecule called carnitine that we basically are, we're gonna take it we're gonna add carnitine we're gonna cleave off our coenzyme A that we just made and we're gonna make acyl carnitine
I'm going to show you the structure. I'm going to put O carnitine here. And then I'll draw the structure of carnitine here. This is car this is this is acyl carnitine. And then this part of the molecule is carnitine. And I guess maybe that explains a little bit, you know, that, that coenzyme A, remember that's a pretty big molecule, so it might be tough to get it across the uh, get it across the mitochondrial <coughs> membrane but the carnitine is relatively small and so it it's the acyl carnitine that ends up <coughs> coming into the mitochondrion And then we basically get, we retransfer it to coenzyme A so that we end up with our, our fatty acyl CoA in the mitochondrion that releases the carnitine. And then that carnitine, actually in the same transporter, the free carnitine passes back through that. That. So this is a carnitine um, palmito, palmito wheel transferase, commonly known as CPT2. There's different isozymes that have different specificities for different acyl chains and all that sort of thing. But generically, you know, as an example of the one that specifically for palmitate would be carnitine palmitoyl transferase. I should give a little bit of organizational like uh, overview here. So this is fatty acid catabolism. Maybe this first one will be transfer of acyl coase into mitochondria. Okay, so here's another here's another version of, of that. Basically, we see the uh, carnitine. This is here. It, they use a slightly different name. This carnitine carrier protein here, but it, but um, oh, actually, yeah, that's the current the palmitoyl transferase is the one that actually does the transfer there. So now we have the carnitine over here, uh, and and we remake our coenzyme A. So the net reaction is the transfer of the coenzyme A. One of the reasons I kind of wanted to put it up is carnitine, you, um, you know, 
uh, you see a lot of, it'll be sold as a supplement. Actually, that monster in, in energy drink of my daughter's that I brought in, it had carnitine in there. That was a big thing in there. Um, my understanding is that, you know, can carnitine supplements increase like this? This is according to the NIH. So there's a nice NIH supplement database, which will summarize, if you're curious, which will summarize the, um, uh, summarize the evidence for or against the efficacy of different nutritional supplements. And uh, I think it's actually pretty good, because they'll say, you know, there's no evidence for, for the efficacy. They'll say there isn't enough evidence the other way, or they'll say uh, their studies have been done, but it shows it's ineffective, right? They'll, they'll, they won't just say, if there's no evidence for it, they won't they can necessarily say it doesn't work, they'll just say there's not enough evidence for it. Anyway, 20 years of research finds no consistent evidence that carnitine supplements can improve exercise or physical performance in healthy subjects as under a certain uh, uh, dose range. Now, there's another compound called creatine, which is very, very similar kind of names, that actually serves as a, uh, it serves essentially as a rapid source of, uh, of phosphates for the, the resynthesis of ATP in muscle tissue. So basically, you can have, if you have this creatine phosphate and you get ADP, it will rapidly transfer its phosphate to ADP. To ATP. So it's like, like a, a, a very immediate reserve of ATP for uh, like this. Uh, and um, that one actually, there is evidence for its efficacy, particularly for weightlifters and that sort of thing. Less so for carnitine. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into beta oxidation. Actually, let me fix this. This is the transferase. This is the carnitine transferase. Professor? Yes. Um, the bottom arrow pointing into the mitochondria, what is it starting at? Does it? Here? Yeah. That is the carnitine that was okay. made. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so now what we have is Coenzyme A thioester in the mitochondrion. So this is going to be beta oxidation. I'm just going to put R for the rest of it. Now I'll tell you, I'm gonna kind of give you a preview. What we're gonna actually wanna do in this whole thing is we wanna put a keto group at this position. And if we put a keto group at this position, then we can cut these two carbons off as acetyl-CoA. And they can enter in the citric acid cycle and be oxidized in the citric acid cycle. So ultimately what we wanna do is we wanna chop these two carbons off to generate acetyl-CoA. In order to chop them off, we need a keto group in this, that position. So the question is, well, how do we get a keto group? Well, I'm gonna remind you that we've actually kind of done this. We did this in the citric acid cycle. In the citric acid cycle, we had Actually, I'm gonna draw it the way I drew it in the citric acid cycle, because to, uh, to help maybe remind you a little bit. We 
we had this molecule, which was what? Succinate. And then what we ended up doing is we ended up putting a, uh, actually putting a, a, a keto group on this position. That's oxaloacetate. So we went to oxaloacetate. So how did we get, go from succinate to the oxaloacetate? If you remember back, what we did is we put a double bond in between here, then we added water across the double bond that gave us an OH, and then we oxidized that OH to the keto group. So we put the double bond in, that was fumarate, then we uh, added the water that was made malate, and then we oxidized the malate to make oxaloacetate. So we're gonna basically do the same kind of thing. The first step is we are going to put a double bond in here. That is going to, let's see, in this reaction, when we took, put the double bond in here, if you remember, this was succinate dehydrogenase. And we had FAD and FADH2, and I made the point that, oh, this is actually complex two of the electron transport chain, and this FADH2 is really an enzyme-bound FADH2, and we ended up making fumarate. And then, you know, ultimately through that complex too, what that did is, is that transferred those electrons to coenzyme Q. And then that would pass it like this. And so this, these basically go to the electron transport chain. I'm just going to simplify it by saying going to the electron transport chain. We're going to do the same kind of thing here. We're going to have actually FAD, FADH2. We're going to create, it's also a trans double bond. And this is known as acyl CoA dehydrogenase. This is an also another complex within the inner mitochondrial membrane. We could, I, I, I don't think anybody's given a, a Roman numeral, we could call it complex seven or something like that. Uh, another complex within the inner mitochondrial membrane, and these FADH2, those are gonna go to the electron transport chain. This molecule here is, um, uh, oh, this is CoA, sorry, S-CoA, oh, this is a coenzyme. This is um, trans, this is acyl-CoA, this is trans enoyl coa All right, does anybody remember in the citric acid cycle what the next step is after fumarate? Is it malate? What? Malate or something? Yeah, that sounds right. Fumarase, fumarase, what it was. And it basically, we added water. Oh, there's one. <laughs> across that double bond. And we made melee. There we go. That was, there you go. That was, might have been what you were referring like this. We just added water across that double bond. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to add water. And we're going to make what's known as B 
beta hydroxy acyl CoA. This enzyme is known as enoyl CoA hydratase. Yeah. Now in the citric acid cycle, our next step was to oxidize this alcohol here to a keto group. That ended up generating an NADH. And this made our oxaloacetate. That that and that's the that's the compound that ends up reacting with acetyl CoA to make citrate. That's kind of, that's the compound that gets to the end of the cycle before you start a new cycle. All right. So over here we're doing the same thing. We're going to take NAD, make NADH. And then, sorry, I'm getting low here. This is this compound is beta keto acyl CoA. Now this NADH that we just generated, it can do just like the NADH that from the citric acid cycle. We can go to complex one. So we can basically see how this process of beta oxidation is very tightly coupled to, to the electron transport chain, right? One of the enzymes is actually a, a, a complex within the inner mitochondrial membrane that can transfer electrons to Q, which can then go to um, the rest of the electron transport chain. And also one of the enzymes generates NADH, which can go to complex one. And then all of those, those high energy electrons can drive the electron transport chain for, for uh, ATP synthesis, provided that we have some oxygen so, they'll, so, that, the, um, uh, so that the electron transport chain can run. All right, so the next step is to take these guys here and cleave them off. So I'm going to go to a different. Wait, do we need to know the enzyme to get? Oh, you. This enzyme yeah. is um, beta hydroxy. Acyl CoA dehydrogenase. That's a big. A lot of places, the beta, the alpha and beta terminology is adopted. It's, is sometimes kept, and sometimes people change it to two. Like this will be three hydroxy acyl CoA rather than beta hydroxy acyl CoA. And you'll see some variation in terminology. All right, but now what I want to do is I want to redraw that we're going to redraw the
So again, this is the beta keto basal CoA molecule. And now what we can do is we can take in, bring in coenzyme A. It's going to react here and it's going to end up driving the releasing acetyl-CoA. All right, so this, this is going to get cut off as acetyl-CoA, and that's going to leave us with a new acyl-CoA that's two carbon short shorter. because we chopped off those two carbons that are now part of acetyl-CoA. So this acetyl-CoA can go to the citric acid cycle. This enzyme is known as thiolase. Professor, can I ask a dumb question? Mm -hmm. um, so at the beta oxidation, we've got three carbons and then after the acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, we have four. Yes, you know, to, to probably make it a little bit, you know, this R is basically varying here. I okay. should probably do that. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> So this, yeah, thiolase. So this, that can go to the citric acid cycle. So then, you know, it goes into the citric acid cycle. Those, you're going to crank through the carbon cycle. They're going to get converted to CO2. And then they are going to uh, generate NADHs and FADH2, drive the electron transport chain, right? Again, that only is going to happen if you have the availability of oxygen to, to serve as the terminal electron and electron transport chain. New acyl-CoA that has two less carbon. So now, what happens, this can basically come back up here, and the cycle continues, all right, with a shorter fatty acid. Or fatty acyl-CoA. And it'll go through these different reactions, come back here, drop another two carbons off. So we go from 16 carbons to 14 carbons, then 12 carbons, then 10 carbons, and then all the way down until we get to four carbons, and then it just splits it in half into two acetyl-CoA. When does the cycle stop? It stops when the when you basically have chopped it up into all that all that's used up. Let me kind of maybe try to explain it here. All right, so that when we look at Here is, uh, this is, I'm, I'm going to put palmitil coa one, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. 
There's palmitoyl-CoA. Okay, so each round of beta oxidation, so this palmitoyl-CoA is going to start in here, and it goes through this process, and we're going to chop two carbons off. So we're basically going to go down here. So we're going to cleave those two carbons off. So that's one round of beta oxidation. Then after one round, we've, we've introduced a, uh, you know, we've introduced a carbonyl here with coa thioester, right? And so we, it's all set up to do another round. And we're, after that round, we're gonna chop two carbons off. And then we're gonna chop two carbons off. Then we're gonna, you know, go around, chop, each time we're chopping two carbons off, we're generating acetyl-CoA, we're generating some FADH, some NADH, plenty of high energy electrons to take to the electron transport chain. go through here, and then at the very end, we're gonna have four carbons, and we're gonna make two acetyl-CoA's. So all of these are gonna end up you know, making acetyl-CoA's. Each time we chop, we're gonna make acetyl-CoA's. We're gonna chop it up. Now one of the reasons I'm doing this is there's a homework problem, I believe, if I remember right, that says, how many rounds of beta oxidation do you need to chop up a 16 carbon fatty acid like this? And so the, the answer is usually, you know, I'll go, well, I'm gonna go uh, 16 and, and you get two, it's like 16 divided by two is eight. Well, it's no, if you actually look at it, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It takes seven rounds of beta oxidation to chop up a 16 carbon fatty acid into, uh, into eight acetyl-CoA units that all can enter the citric acid cycle. Does that kind of make some sense? Okay, we're chopping this up. Okay, I'm gonna show you another little kind of cute thing. This is kind of showing, this is, this is basically, a, this is the mitochondrial electron transport chain and showing coenzyme Q as being a key intermediate and that mitochondrial enzyme chain goes to QH2. And, we, and, and when we already talked about the electron chains, we can talk about QH2 being generated by complex one or complex two. And now what we're saying, you know, these enzymes of fat oxidation also generate Q and all of those, you know, so the Q becomes a, a, uh, a, a pool that feeds into then complex two and, uh, or complex three and complex four in the electron transport chain, generating that high energy requirement. Again, all this requires, uh, requires oxygen. So here's, this is kind of a cool little thing. If you go through and do the stoichiometry of, uh, of um, carbon dioxide production and oxygen uh, composition, when we did the complete oxidation of glucose here, what do we have? We had C6 plus, or, or a, a glucose plus 6O2 goes to six carbon dioxide in water. There's a, a, a term known as the respiratory quotient, which is the ratio of um, uh, the ratio of carbon dioxide emitted to oxygen consumed. And in this case, that ratio, this molar ratio, is one, because there are six carbon dioxide emitted for six oxygen consumed, okay? Now, if you take a triglyceride, okay, and you go through, and it gets complicated, but you follow all through the whole th kind of thing, you'll find out the stoichiometry is, if you take one triglyceride, you react it with 80 oxygens, and it generates 57 carbon dioxides and 52 waters, okay? That respiratory coefficient is now 57 over 8.2 or 0 0.71. So what exercise physiologists can do is they can hook you up to a gizmo that will actually measure the amount of oxygen that, that you're uh, consuming and the amount of carbon dioxide. And while you're exercising, they can measure what the RQ ratio is. If the RQ ratio is 0 0.71, 
that means you're burning only fat. If the RQ is 1.0, that means you're burning only carbohydrate. And in, anything in between is your mixture of the amount of carbohydrate for the amount of fat that you're actually burning. So they do experiments like this, where uh, this is, um, let's see, people, a treadmill marathon, people running a treadmill marathon here, okay? And they're, they hook the people up to the, one of these gizmos that's measuring the respiratory coefficient and, you know, goes from 0 0.7 up to, up to 1. And then they can convert that to total energy consumed as carbohydrates. So they, and they had two sets of runners on this. They had some fast runners. I think they were all relatively well trained, but they were there were fast runners or there were slow runners here. Okay, the fast runners when they're going, they're going and they're running. They're using almost all carbohydrates, right, in their in their oxidative metabolism, and they can actually get through this marathon quickly. What was their time? They ended here. Uh, oh yeah, they they ended uh, they ended here. Hundred and was that two and a half hours? That's a pretty fast, uh, pretty fast marathon. And they've basically mostly been been burning uh, carbohydrates. But the plotters, us plotters, are still burning a significant amount. But you basically um, then you uh, uh, you burn an amount, but less than the the fast runners. The, here's the kind of thing you get to this point here, then all of a sudden it drops. Right now you're burning mostly fat. What has happened at this point in time is what's known as the bonk. Basically, if you, it, you've run out of muscle glycogen and probably most of your liver glycogen as well, and you just run out of, of carbohydrates to burn, right? And so now your, your muscle contraction is, uh, is having to rely strictly on, uh, strictly on metabolism of fats. That takes more oxygen. And so you start, you're running the same pace, all of a sudden you start having to breathe a lot heavier. For, for a lot of runners that, if, you know if anybody's been in the California International Marathon, that's the one that runs from Folsom down to, to downtown here. Happens the first week of December every year. Anyway, if you come out here at Sac State, because it comes up over the HC Bridge out there, you'll see a lot of people right about here, right about here. That's the, the in the marathon they call it the wall. Cyclists have the same thing happen, they call it bonking. And all of a sudden, you just can't go without breathing really heavily. When I was running marathons, you could just tell. It's like you're looking at your pace, you're slowing down, and you're breathing like you're sprinting, right? You're just huffing and puffing because you basically run out of carbohydrates. You're relying totally on fats for ATP production. And again, all that fat metabolism is linked to the electron transport chain. That, that electron transport chain is oxygen. So in order to get the ATP out of that fat, you have to burn oxygen. Anyway, it's kind of fun, kind of a fun thing. Um, oh, the other thing I guess, um, yeah, let me just reiterate, re reiterate this a little bit. The, uh, is that, just reiterate the fact that um, fat, that we know this fat metabolism generating a bunch of acetyl-CoA, right, that's going to the citric acid cycle. But, but we can't use that to regenerate glucose. Because as that acetyl-CoA goes into the citric acid cycle, it immediately goes to the first part of the citric acid cycle, which are decarboxylation reactions. So there's two carbons that go in, get lost as CO2 as it goes through the citric acid cycle. And there's no net gain of carbon within the intermediates of the, of the citric acid cycle. And so there's nothing that can be siphoned off for gluconeogenesis, right? So, so human beings can't convert fats to carbohydrates. So this becomes a question then as well, what happens if you start getting really low blood sugar? And I'm talking about really low blood sugar, like, like people who have unregulated blood sugar due to diabetes, or people who are starving, or that, that sort of thing. What happens? The brain, needs, uh, the brain needs those carbohydrates. Well, there's a backup, and the backup is ketone bodies. And which acetyl-CoA is basically converted to a, a series of different molecules. These are the, the ketone bo the bodies, acetoacetate, acetone, beta-hydroxybutyrate. I think this is probably the, the most 
abundant one. It's always a little bit of a problem because the most abundant ketone body isn't actually a ketone, but beta-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, and the brain can use the beta-hydroxybutyrate as an energy source. You've probably heard of this, this ketosis, that sort of thing. And um, the, uh, yeah, this is the, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not, I, I want you to be aware of this. Uh, I'm not gonna go get into details. But basically, again, what we have is our acetyl-CoA. You end up making this acetyl-CETYL-CoA, this compound hydroxymethyl-CoA, that part of the pathway is actually shared with sterile biosynthesis. And then we end up ultimately making, making these ketone bodies. And then the brain can actually absorb these ketone bodies and uh, take, say, the beta-hydroxybutyrate, convert it back, make some NADH out of it, uh, and uh, yeah, make, get some NADH to be able to make some ATP. But it's really an emergency fuel. And one of the things I, I, I mentioned about that, because you hear these keto diet kind of things, I, I think I got, got on this um, a soapbox a little bit before. Most keto diets really aren't keto diets because you'll still be eating protein. As long as you're eating protein, protein will be uh, degraded uh, into, uh, uh, into citric acid cyclointermediates, which can be siphoned off uh, for um, fatty acid, uh, siphoned off for, um, uh, uh, be siphoned off for, uh, for gluconeogenesis. Uh, and it really takes kind of some pretty severe metabolic imbalance before you really induce uh, uh, ketosis. Um, so you know, people, again, with highly unregulated blood sugar, uh, and, which is why a lot of the diabetes test looks for ketone bodies in, uh, in blood, and then, um, uh, and uh, oh, uh, people who go do fasting, like seriously, like you know, fast for two or three weeks and do anything, and just have like electrolyte solutions to keep them going, they'll induce uh, ketosis. Um, I tried. I was going to show for a class when I was running marathons. I tried. I saw. Oh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to measure the ketones in in my pee before the marathon and after the marathon, thinking that the marathon might actually induce some ketosis because I was run out of car and that it actually was I was pretty good. Anyway, so that's that. All right, so we'll stop there, and then we'll um, uh, then we will uh, come back. And tomorrow, what I'm going to do is talk about fatty acid biosynthesis, and then we'll talk a little bit about amino acid catabolism and how it feeds in, into those. Uh, the other thing I was going to do, uh, and but don't feel obligated, but just because it's kind of a cool story, is I'll, I'll show you the. Um, I'll, I'll show you the YouTube video talking about Kim Walmsley's story. <laughs>